السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين My brothers and sisters Ramadan is a month not just of fasting but many other acts of worship and Allah Almighty has multiplied the reward of any act of worship that is done during the month of Ramadan so he wants us to get used to doing as many deeds as possible so that once Ramadan is done, it becomes so simple and easy to pray because you've been engaging in so much more. It's so easy to stay away from consumption of that which is haram because you were used to staying away from consumption of any sort. And in a similar fashion, it becomes quite easy to do so many things. That's how it's supposed to be. One of the things that we do in the month of Ramadan is to give. We give. What do we give? What do we give in Ramadan? Zakat. Someone says zakat. Correct. What else? Sadaqat. What else? What's the difference between zakat and sadaqat? I can tell you, zakat and sadaqat, primarily the term sadaqa in the Arabic language would include a zakat. But in some cultures, they differentiate between that which is compulsory, the two and a half percent, that which is perhaps a penalization such as a kafara or a fidya, and that which is aqiqa and, and something that is to be given at the time of the birth of a child and so on. So all those would be sadaqat and that which is totally voluntary. There is no occasion for this. I just want to give. That's just for the sake of Allah. It's not zakat. It's considered a sadaqa. So a sadaqa can either be that which is compulsory or not compulsory. But when it comes to zakat, it's only referring to one thing. And that is 2.5% of, generally 2.5% of your savings or a certain type of wealth that you have. Now, if you are a Muslim, you would realize that every time you earn something, that wealth is sustenance provided by Allah for you and it was destined for you and no one else. Whatever you're going to get right to the end, the last breath will come to you in full before you die. The hadith says you need to know that no soul shall die until it receives every droplet of sustenance that is written for it. I remember years ago, I gave an example of food and drink and I said, you know, if you have 500 eggs written for you in your life, you won't die if you've eaten 499. You have to wait for that one to come in and then you're gonna go. So one of the youngsters told me, I'm gonna slow down on eggs. And I'm thinking to myself, gosh, people can understand things in a weird way. The point, the point is, the grains of rice that are for you, if it's 50,553,241 and a half a grain, trust me, you're not going to die until that half a grain is eaten by you and gone in. It was yours. That's what the hadith says. It's written. However, you cannot sit back and say, because my sustenance is written, I can just chill. Because in that case, it would have been written that you were silly to think that you, you can just chill and things are going to come for you. The fact that you don't know how much is written for you, you need to make an effort with the capacity and energy and brains given to you by Allah to earn. Make an effort. Allah gave me the ability Allah gave me the capacity, the brains, I'm going to try, I'm going to keep trying. And then you can say, mashallah, yeah, Allah wrote for me quite a bit. Allah wrote for me that I would be intelligent. Allah wrote for me that I would have the energy. Allah wrote for me that I would bring the two together and use that energy to do something intelligent. And Allah wrote for me that as a result, he would give me through his mercy. Now, the argument is, well, Allah's written this for you. So, if Allah has written things, why do we need to bother when we believe in destiny? Similar to what I just said now. 
However, when you look at destiny itself, a good question would be the same question. Where are you going? To Jannah or Jahannam? Do you know? I know. I'm going to Jannah. I refuse to go anywhere else. I'll fight for it. Inshallah. But ultimately, that's what I believe, right? Allah knows. Allah has already destined it. May Allah, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not allow us to go anywhere else besides Jannah. Right? Say, I mean, it's Ramadan. Come on, guys. You need to have hope. You need to have conviction. I'm going to Jannah. Someone says, where are you going? Say, I'm going to Jannah. No, you might go. I'm not. I'm not. I refuse. I have a Lord who's merciful. He's going to forgive me. He's going to give me. He's going to grant me. So anyway, let's get back to the question. If someone might say, where are you going? I don't know where I'm going. That's the proper answer, right? But Allah knows. If Allah knows, why am I wasting my time doing things? You're not wasting your time. The fact that you don't know is what is the whole game. The whole game is that you don't know. If you knew, then you could say, what's the point? I already know I'm going. You, you get what I'm saying? If you knew that you're not going to make money out of a deal, would you go into the deal? No, you wouldn't. Or if you knew you're going to make millions out of a deal, would you miss the deal? No, you wouldn't. The same applies if you knew you're going to Jahannam, you'd become a devil now. Astaghfirullah. May Allah protect all of us. But the fact is we don't know. That's what makes it interesting. How much money are you going to have in your life? You don't know. So you have to work towards it. You have to work towards it. And inshallah, hope in the mercy of Allah. And I tell you what, Allah has not connected education to wealth. Completely. No, he hasn't. To a degree, maybe one might argue, okay, you may have a better life. There are more chances of you getting a job and so on. So it's intelligent and wise to have a bit of an education and so on. However, sometimes, a lot of the times, in fact, there are those who are less educated who are wealthier than the educated. In fact, if I do a quick deal, I come from a country called Zimbabwe. They do deals, you know, they do deals, meaning because the economy is so bad, if you were to be a doctor, you'd probably earn a tenth of a guy walking on the street selling tomatoes. Well, maybe not as bad as that, but a guy doing things, you know. So if you're just a business person or you strike the right thing, even online today, mashallah, you want to sell something and the next best thing, you have 200,000 orders. Forget about the medicine I was studying. Man, come on. I'd rather go on to TikTok, right? Astaghfirullah. I don't mean it, but I mean it. <laughs> so what I mean is I don't mean it the bad way. I mean it the good way. If it's something halal and permissible, why not? By all means, mashallah, I make dua for you and I will not ask you for 10%. I hope you got that one. <laughs> the reality is Allah wants you to use your effort, your energy to the maximum of your ability, but don't allow haughtiness to overtake you. Sometimes those who are less educated, in fact, a lot of the times, like I just said, are wealthier. They have a lot more wealth. Why? It's Allah's way of telling you, look, it's me who gives. It doesn't mean because you're highly educated, you're going to have more. I'll give you. I'll give everyone. I'll give the ants. I'll give all the creatures. You know, I went down scuba diving somewhere. The creatures I saw down there, literally in their millions, the species, millions. And I'm thinking to myself, Subhanallah, Rabbil Alameen. Subhanallah. If Allah has provided for the weirdest looking sea creatures in the depth of the ocean that we don't even know exist, you really think he's going to miss me and you? Come on. When insan is known as Ashraful Makhluqat, mankind is the best or the highest of all the creatures of Allah, the noblest. And from amongst us, we have Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The highest of all creatures is mankind. And the highest of mankind is Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. My brothers and sisters, when Allah gives you, why is he giving you? Why does Allah give you? If I ask you, you want to work for me? Yes. What salary do you want? What would you say? I think 
a lot of youngsters at the beginning, opening salary, what would they say? Give me, give me some suggestions. Let's see. What would you say? 45,000 a year. Not bad. Not bad at all. 45,000 a year. I'll probably give that to you, brother. If ever I get it. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, by the way, 45,000 is fine. You're asking for 45,000. You want to work. What do you want that money for? It's a question. You know, what I'm saying is going to be very deep. So let's listen. You want that money for what, my brother? What do you want 45,000 for? Tell me. Your future wife. I thought you want to eat food, bro. If you don't eat, you're not going to have a life. If you don't have a life, you won't have a wife. You might have the food in Jannah, but that you can make dua for, my brother. The first thing you need is food and drink, my brother. You can't just look at your wife and say, I'm breathing, I feel full, man. You know, subhanAllah. At least you gave us something to talk about, my brother. Jazakallah khair. Big blunder. Anyway, first thing, you, you have your money. You need to arrange your food, your drink, your clothing, your accommodation. Agreed? You need to budget it properly and then you can start thinking, right, I can afford all of this. Let me think of a wife, right? Alhamdulillah. Now you have a wife. She come in and mashallah, you can make a life. May Allah bless all of us with beautiful spouses. I mean, and when I say beautiful spouses, the other day someone said, is that a dua for multiple wives? I said, no, listen. <laughs> That's a dua because we are plural. So I'm saying spouses because we are plural. I can't say may Allah bless all of us with a beautiful spouse. I mean, with good spouses. That's what we mean. So it depends on your mind. Mind. The other day there was a footballer who said uh, something about wives. And so someone in the comments said, notice how he said wife. Just because he was a Muslim. I said, but he's talking about a plural number of people. So he's definitely going to use the plural. But because you're stigmatized and you're looking at a certain angle and you're already looking at it from a preconceived, you know, point, therefore you think, I'm just clarifying myself. Because sometimes the people get upset, you know. What type of dua was that, Chef? I said, well, we made dua for our spouses. I said, may Allah bless all of us. I mean. So then what more do you want with your money? I would like to do a few things. What is it? Well, once I've done my necessity, there's going to be leftover change. What are you going to use it for? Please, can I have answers? Now that there's leftover change, you've got food, clothing, accommodation, mashallah, you're married, you're taking care of your wife, your children, and so on. Now what do you want money for? Tell me. Please say it. Habibi, my beloved uncle, we weren't asking you. <laughs> We weren't asking you because your answer is right. And I knew that you would say that. I'm looking at all the young lads here. I want to know what they would spend all that money on. Because they would probably say, a bag, a bag Porsche, a bag Bugatti. Agreed. Agreed, guys? Young men, come on, guys. I know we're fasting and I know we're at Saffron and I know it's about to, uh, mashallah, the Adhan's about to call, but there's still a while. Come on, guys. You would use your extra money for that which is not your basic necessity, luxuries, whatever makes you happy. B before you had a pen, now it's Mont Blanc, agreed. Before you had a bag, now, before you had a wallet, now it's Louis Vuitton, agreed. <laughs> and before you had normal undies, and now it's Pierre Cadet, agreed? Yeah. They even take the label off on the side and say, you see, designer, bro. My brother, your heart has to be designer. Your heart has to be designer. The rest of it is by the way. I promise you. But that's what people want money for. Allah says, before you go there, the rest of that cash, for every hundred, two and a half is mine, not yours. Only 97.5 is yours. And I want you to use it in one of these places. Here it goes. That's what Allah says. And who is Allah? Allah is the giver who gave you all of the money in the first place. He did not say cut it out of your necessity. He did not say cut it out of that which you are going to spend within the year. He did not say cut it out of something you needed. He said cut it out of the excess that which you've saved for more than a year. That which you're whatever else. There are a few conditions. That's not the topic today. But you would give the zakat of the wealth because it belongs not to you but to Allah. So are you doing anyone a favor? You're doing yourself a favor. That money was never ever yours. And if you've kept it, unfortunately, it's stolen cash. That's what it is. And Allah will take it away from you somehow. I always tell people, when you don't work out your zakat properly, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help all of us. If you're, if you're going to intentionally just say, you know, it's okay. 
Allah will take that money through some other means. What are the other means? Something, some calamity might come and your money is gone. What happened? I had 20 grand. You know, I didn't work out my zakat two years, three years. And you know what? The whole thing just went. I just, this thing burnt down. That thing happened. This thing happened. There was sickness. There was accident. There was whatever. It doesn't mean that every time there is a loss that you didn't work out your zakat correctly. But it does mean whenever there's a loss, one of the first questions you should ask yourself is, have I been giving my charity correctly? Because the hadith tells you not only about zakat, that if you are to give charity, automatically Allah will save you and protect you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will extinguish calamity that was coming in your direction simply because you gave a charity. Why is it so important? Look, Allah is the owner of the worlds. He doesn't need you and I to feed the ants. Not at all. So if he doesn't need you and I to feed the ants, do you think he needs you and I to feed another human being? He doesn't. But he created it in a unique way because he wants us to engage in an act of worship to gain closeness to him because the whole idea is if you love Allah, you would have to love everything else that Allah has made to a degree. If I love someone, everything connected to that person is going to be important to me. I mean, you can't say that you really love someone crazy and then whatever's important to them is not even important to you. That's not love. There's a problem with that love. So to be compassionate is a quality that Allah wants to develop within us. So whenever you see something really sad, automatically it should be in the heart of a believer. What can I do about this? Oh Allah, help them. Oh Allah, guide them. Oh Allah alleviate their suffer, suffering, their struggles. When you hear about someone suffering in the corner of Afghanistan and in your heart, you would say, oh Allah, help these people to start with. Then what would I do? How can I help now? Maybe I've made the dua, but perhaps I can give them some money. Maybe I can offer them something, whatever, according to my capacity, who I am and what I can do. All that is part of the qualities of a believer. You believe in Allah. You have to be compassionate. So much so that even towards the animals, when you see an animal suffering, it should be your business to try and end the suffering of the animal. And if you cause the suffering of an animal, there is bad news. The bad news is that perhaps you might be punished as a result of you causing suffering towards animals. Do you know even the pests that we have and the parasites and so on, say mosquitoes, if you want to deal with mosquitoes, you've got to deal with them in the best possible way, such that they don't suffer. They're either alive or dead, but not in the middle. You know, you don't pick out a mosquito and then get it and look at it under a microscope and pull out one leg and then pull out the other leg and say, you've been making sounds at my ears every night. You don't do that. Not at all. The same would apply with rodents and whatever else it may be. If it's a pest and a parasite or whatever, you need to get rid of it quickly, fast. Why? Because... You need to be humane. I, I don't want this thing to suffer. I'd rather just take its life and that's it. We're gone. May Allah Almighty grant us goodness. However, to assist and to help is one of the things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to do. And as a result, my brothers and sisters, over and above zakat, which is 2.5% in most cases. I say most cases because... There's a time when you've got to give 10%. There's a time when you've got to give 5%. There's a time when you've got to give 20%. I don't know if you know of these percentages. If you're in farming, you would know what I spoke about. And if you're in mining, you would know what I'm saying. But if you're not in mining or farming, it may not be applicable to you. So there goes. Normally, general trade and the rest of us is 2.5%. If you're in farming, then it's either 5% if you're using your own irrigation and 10% if it's from the rain of the heavens, meaning the rain of the skies. And if it's mining upon extraction, 20%. Allahu Akbar. Did you guys know this? Did you know this? Well, at least you learned something, mashallah. I had a feeling you wouldn't because it doesn't apply. A lot of the time it doesn't apply to people. That's why when they say zakat 2.5%, technically there is a different type of zakat. If you have <laughs> livestock, you actually calculate it very differently. There's a whole list of things and how you do it. And that's not going to be our topic. But as you give, you are only giving from the excess. The calculation is from the excess that you have. Okay. Allah is watching you and he wants to see what you do. So he tells you something very interesting. He says, 
2.5% is mine, not yours. If you keep it, like I said, you've stolen from Allah. You have to give it. But I want to watch what you give from you. How much have you given? Not from mine, from you, yourself. Some give an extra two and a half. Okay, that's mine. They call it Lillah. It's just for the sake of Allah. It's not Zakat, it's Sadaqah. It's just, it's just something voluntary, right? Many of us don't realize the importance of that which comes from you and your pocket. In fact, the reward of that is something else. It's like when you pray. See, every act of worship has, has within it the compulsory part of it and the voluntary. And Allah tells you in the Hadith Qudsi that I love most that which, is, which I've made compulsory. In fact, the Hadith is worded such that there is nothing more loved to me than that which I made compulsory upon you. Whether it's prayer, so I need to do the farad of Fajr, which is two units of, uh, and then four units of Dhuhr, and so on, right? Allah loves that. He loves it the most. You do it, mashallah, you fulfilled your duty. Well done. Alhamdulillah. Like I said, inshallah, we're not going to Jahannam. We're not going to go to hellfire. But the hadith says, you continue to gain closeness to me through sunnah and nafil. What is sunnah and nafil? That which the Prophet ﷺ did, but it's not compulsory, but he did it. I'm going to copy that. I want to do that. You do it, you start getting even closer to Allah. And nafil, and nafil means that which is permissible and it's left to your discretion when you did it from the goodness of your heart. Now you get even closer to Allah. Even closer to Allah. Until you achieve such closeness to Allah that He becomes the hands that you hold with, the, the legs that you walk with and so on. Mentioned in the hadith. What that means is Everything you do, you're conscious of Allah. Everything you do, when I'm going to hold something, earn something, say something, walk towards something, all of that is part of what Allah has ordained. And I'm not going to go out of that. So when you give a charity, Allah Almighty protects you from harm. <laughs> Prophet ﷺ says the charity will extinguish calamity. So give a bit more. You don't know. You can only find out on the Day of Judgment. One thing I've learned is on the Day of Judgment or in the hereafter at least, when you want to know certain things that you didn't know on earth, you'll be able to know them if you remember them at the time. You can say, Oh Allah, what? show me what were the calamities that were supposed to come in my direction and they didn't come as a result of your mercy or as a result of something. And what was that thing? And then you can slowly see them one by one and you'll be shocked, shocked that you were supposed to do this and this and this. You were supposed to face this, but we diverted it. And this is what we did. And we protected you and we elevated you as a result of this sadaqah, as a result of that you did, as a result of this goodness you did and so on. It's too good. It's from your own wealth. I'm doing good. And try to space it out. Not that I gave a million today and then for two years I didn't give anything. No. Try to space it out. Yes, you can give a big charity if Allah's given you a big deal and that's fine. But if you're getting a, a, a regular salary, take out something and say, look, that's a portion. Charity, sadaqah. And give it to a cause that is probably the best cause. What are the best causes? What's the best cause? The best cause is a charity that you give, the reward of which outlives you. That's the best. It's called a sadaqah jariyah. It's a charity. You know, the, the, there is a waqf that, the, the national waqf is here this evening. And I tell you what, the idea of a waqf is an endowment. We have given money towards a, a charity that is going to last long. The reward of which may Last forever. I remembered something very quickly. Let me mention it. How many of you have been to Medina Munawara? Please put up your hands. A fair number. Put down your hands. Towards the northern section, the northern part of the masjid, that's the back, 
you know, the Qibla is facing the south there, and so the north is the back, right, where the Hilton is and so on. At the back of those hotels, there is an intercontinental. There's a Moven pick, there's a few hotels. As you walk away from the Haram, you get to a corner opposite a marketplace called Dawudiya, which they're in the process of demolishing. But before you cross that road, there's a massive building, massive building. And you know what it says? To this day, there is a sign there saying, Waqf of Uthman bin Affan radiallahu anhu. Have you seen that? It says Waqf of Uthman bin Affan. Every time I pass it, whoever I'm with, I show them, that's the Waqf of Uthman bin Affan. There's a massive hotel there right now. Every droplet and every penny and everything that goes, actually goes to the Waqf, the, the endowment. All of it. Sakallah khair, brother. That was quite alert of you, mashallah. So, what happened? He gave a little orchard and there were palms there and that land was given. And over the years, they used to collect from there the dates and give them and distribute them and whatever else and the charities and everything happened and it used to produce so much. The day that they were demolishing all of this and putting up buildings, you couldn't do it. This belonged to Uthman bin Affan radiallahu anhu. It can't happen. You know, you can't do this. So what happened? As a result, they decided, okay, we'll take this and we'll put up the building here so that there's no longer a, you know, a, 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 a palm or a dates farm there in the middle of all the buildings. But we will put up a building and the money will still go back to the same work. And so those who were running it, who are still coming down from that time, they decided, okay, leave it be, meaning let it happen. And so they put up a building. To this day, anyone who stays there, guess what? Your money is going to go to the waqf of Uthman bin Affan. Subhanallah, amazing. Now, when I see that, I think to myself, I need to do something like this too, man. Come on, imagine. It may work, it may not work, in the sense that who knows how long it's going to last. You could get someone and take it away. I know a few things of Medina Munawara that have come to my mind, but inshallah on another occasion. So my brothers and sisters, remember something. When we give charities, think of the best way of giving, depending on how much you have. You have a small amount, it might not be sadaqa jariya as such. But if you've helped someone with school fees, for example, and you've educated them, wallahi, it will continue after you die. And if you've helped someone, for example, with uh, you taught them something, you, you sat with them and you spent time with them, it's also a sadaqa jariya. The Prophet ﷺ says, when you spend time with your children and, and help develop them, and as they grow older, if they're going to pray for you after you've died, that's a sadaqa jari, it's a charity. What did I do? I just looked after my kids nicely, and they prayed for me. So may Allah make it easy for us. Remember to give in the cause of Allah, and remember the benefit will come to us. Allah doesn't need it. Allah is the Lord of the worlds. He created the scenario such that they are poor and they are wealthy. And there are people in the middle, neither poor nor wealthy. That was Allah's plan. He designed our hearts and minds in a way that we feel a level of compassion. And when we polish our qualities, that level of compassion goes up. And when that happens, you begin to become generous. And as you become generous, it is a prophetic quality. And when you develop a prophetic quality, you get closeness to Allah. And if you were to die in that condition, you go to Jannah just by giving. That's why the Prophet ﷺ, when he got up and he said, for example, once that who will buy this well and for them is paradise. And Uthman ibn Affan, the same man, radiallahu anhu, they used to call him Uthman. Well, they call him Uthman Ghani. You know why the Ghani comes from? You know where it comes from? He was wealthy. So wealthy that to this day in Medina, Jay, oh, that's Uthman. Well, he was Ghani anyway. Ghani means a wealthy person. That's why they say Uthman Ghani. Have you heard that name? Yeah, there it goes. So, who will buy this well and for them is paradise? He took the money, he gave it, and the Prophet said, for him is paradise. And he did it more than once with different things. So for him was paradise many times already guaranteed. Subhanallah. Through what? In this instance, through his money. 
Allah might not have blessed you with knowledge. You might not. Allah might not have given you the ability to do so many acts of worship that are there. I'm talking of beyond the farad. Farad you have to. But Allah might have given you wealth or a little bit. The beauty is when you give, it's already an act of worship that earns closeness to Allah no matter who you are and what your condition is. You know, we feel sometimes I'm not pious enough to do this. Do it. Don't let that happen. We're all working progress. That's what it is. And inshallah, we will achieve. There's one last thing I want to tell you. When Allah looks at your charity, He doesn't look at the amount. He looks at the intention, number one. He looks at the purity of the way you gave it. It's also connected to the intention. And it's more to do with the quality of it. Percentage-wise, a person who only owns one measurement of dates, a person who owns one measurement of dates, and that's the only thing he's got, and he gives half of that away, which is a kilo of dates, has given more in the eyes of Allah than a guy who gave a million pounds when he's worth a hundred million. In the eyes of Allah. Where do I get this from? Well, the Quran speaks about one of the battles where people were bringing whatever they could. And here comes Abu Bakr and he brought everything. Umar ibn Khattab anhu brought half. And Uthman bin Affan anhu brought a third of his wealth. I'm sure you might have heard that. But there was a, a man who worked all night. He had nothing. He had nothing. He worked all night and someone gave him a measurement of dates as payment. Two measurements of dates. And as a payment, right? And so he gave one, fi sabilillah, to the Prophet, peace be upon him, for, for the cause. And he kept the other one for his home. What did he give, in essence? What percentage of what he had did he give? 50%. Allah mentions that in the Quran. People were mocking at him. And you know what they said? Inna Allah la ghaniyun an hadha. When, when the guy comes in with his little measurement of dates, people said... Hey, guy, Allah doesn't need these dates. Astaghfirullah. What did you just say? Allah revealed verses. Those who are mocking and laughing at this man who came in with a small measurement, they, Allah will make a mockery of them and they will be laughed at one day. Allahu Akbar. You don't. A guy gives one pound, say, Jazakallah khair, mashallah. Today I was speaking to someone who told me, oh, this charity is not a 100% donation policy. And he mentioned the charity. And I told him, my brother... Whenever you give your zakat a hundred pounds, add another 10. I said, I said, he said, but why? Why should people pay from their own pockets to take your zakat to the poor guy in somewhere in the world? They have spent their money to take your zakat somewhere. You need to give 10 quid to say, listen, this is my hundred. To get my hundred to the poor person, you should use this amount and take it. And, and when you get there and you distribute it, let me know. And I pay you more, not the zakat, not the charity, but for having executed it for me. That's how it should be. But people no longer think like that, do they? Let me give you another quick one. My father always says, because where I come from, there are a lot of poor people. We have distribution of, mashallah, food hampers. So we call in 4,000, 5,000 people. He says, did you pay the bus fare or the, 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 the transport for all of these guys? If you didn't, you've actually cheated them. But how? How could a rich person sit with a bag of, or a food hamper and make a poor person pay for transport to come and accept your pillar of Islam. Are you crazy? This is my pillar of Islam. I want to execute it. I'm going to give zakat. That man's actually paid money to come to me. I should either go to him all the way or I should pay him to come to me. There's no third way. There's no third way. If I've made him come to me and he's paid for it, I need to deduct that amount because you know what? To be very fair and honest, it's, it's wrong. I mean, it's a pillar of Islam, but people don't think that way. They don't think as deep as that. Ah, no, no, these guys are taking money for admin. They need money for admin. Come on. 
If it's ridiculous, yes, you may raise it, but otherwise they need it. But I still do agree. Everyone feels much more inclined towards those who, who take the least or who don't take it all or use their own money or other funds they have to execute it. But still, are you involved in that? Anyway, that was a topic on its own since we're talking about giving. It's very interesting. Think about it. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us all. May he make us from among those who spend these last days of Ramadan also in a bit of giving. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala unite us and gather us in Jannatul Firdaus. My brothers and sisters, I've enjoyed myself. I've spoken for as long as I had to speak. And I'm going to hand over to my brother. Barakallah feek. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.